just before I uh, hand over to you, I want to share with you the most profound quote, I think, uh, that, that I've read in a while, and it's, uh, guess who said it? It's Janice. Uh, it is this, um, simple is the new advanced. And with that, uh, Janice, I I'll turn it over to you with the theme that we have been spending time talking about, uh, uh, Sophia and Rui and uh, others, talking about the conditions on, in, in various locations. Um, and, and today we're fortunate to be able to talk about the conditions in this location ourselves. And with that, Janice, uh, welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for including me. It's really been so interesting uh, listening to everybody and hearing, you know, people's experiences around the world. And I'm aware that there's a lot of uh, medical practitioners in this group. And um, so I, I thought one of the first things I would do is just do a little practice. Um, we're talking about, you know, people sharing their experiences in different locations in the world. And um, one of the main things I've been thinking about in relation to what I want to share today is how these experiences that we have, whether it's, you know, the rug gets pulled out, a divorce, we lose a job, something like that, where everything feels like it's kind of coming unglued, coming undone. And there's this sense of waking up, like, wow, you know, a, a, a stop, everything stops. And we see things from a new perspective, a new view. And I know a lot of the design, I looked up a little bit more about design thinking because I wasn't so familiar with it. So I know there's a lot around uh, perspective and view and, and the creativity and the ideas that come out of that. But what's most interesting to me, because I do work with a lot of people who often come to me in those situations, in those circumstances, is that there's these moments of waking up and then it's very easy to go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. and so we have these ideas, all this energy gets freed up. We're clear, we're awake, we're alert, we're alive, we're enlivened. And then we'd kind of go back to the old grooves, the well-worn paths and the energy and the openness starts to sort of close down. Um, and one of the other things I was thinking about in relation to this is how uh, many people, and I was thinking about this also, the people who work in the medical system and healthcare practitioners that, um, you know, we're also working, we can't override our biology. We're also working with our primal brain and nervous system. And so one of the things that I find very helpful is to speak directly to that primal brain and nervous system that's always, it's called the negativity bias in the brain. We're sort of always scanning the environment for danger, looking for that saber toothed tiger in the jungle, which makes it very hard to focus and mobilize our energy. So uh, the first thing I thought I'd have us do together here is just locate yourself on the planet. You might even um, bring in the image of a globe or a map of the world. And you know that how there's often like a little arrow that says you are here. Just locate yourself on the planet because everybody's in a different place in the world right now. And locate yourself on the planet, the country that you're in. And then kind of zoom that in a little bit to the city or the town that you're in. And then bringing that in a little bit closer to the building or home, the structure that you're in. And then zooming in a little more to the actual space you're in. And you can even look around your room that you're in, look at the colors, the textures, the quality of the light. And if you're outside, you might notice the trees, the breeze. And the senses are like the language of the nervous system. So the more we can open the sense doors, the smells, the sounds, the feeling of the air on the skin, the more that will help to bring us more fully here. And as you bring yourself more fully here to the actual space that you're in, you can even move your attention down a little more, feeling where your body comes into contact with the surface beneath you. 
your seat, your feet, the floor, the earth. And just get that sense of, oh, I am here. I am here. I am here. And notice how it feels to just simply bring yourself here. I'm going to share my slide that I have my four points on. So the slide I chose is the sky because that's the view we want to try to stay connected to. Um, when, when we're in a situation like this, as I mentioned with the pandemic and everything kind of coming unglued, everybody's in a different state of mind and also circumstances and conditions. So some people are going to be obviously struggling much more than others uh, in terms of the conditions and the environment. So that's why doing some kind of practice that can orient us to where we are and mitigate that fight or flight tendency in the nervous system is kind of like a foundational practice that I like to teach people and include just locating ourselves here in the present. So that's the first point in first practice. And these are mostly going to be practices with a little bit of yes, exploration. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. How's that? Because, <laughs> got somebody. With equations on all of them, and and looks like there's. So, if we orient ourselves to where we are, it's a little easier to begin to have some agency over how we respond. So sometimes I call it just hitting the pause button, so that we can actually locate ourselves here, and recognize that in this moment where we are, we can gather and collect and focus our attention and have some agency over what we do with that. Um, and so there's also all these studies that they've done around um, like post, might be called post pandemic, I call this post pandemic mindset. But like after 9-11 or various crises, what they found is that there's something called post traumatic growth where people actually find deeper meaning, they find that they have these experience, experiences of openness and wakefulness and connectedness that they didn't have before. And yet, at the same time, old habits die hard. So, you know, we might think, oh, I'm going to move to another country. Oh, I'm going to leave this relationship and start a new one. Oh, I'm going to change my job. And then as the saying goes, wherever you go, there you are. And it's easy to find yourself <laughs> different person, same relationship, different location, same situation. So how do we work with kind of a deeper sense of transformation in terms of staying open after these big shifts, these big changes? So the first is orienting ourselves. And the next thing is, the, is, is very foundational as well. And this is harnessing our attention because if we don't have any agency over where we place our attention, it's very hard to begin to um, implement or take action around the things that we want to do that might arise out of this big shift we experience. And I want to acknowledge that a lot of people, again, are in very, you know, a range of situations right now in terms of what's even possible. But as I've been listening to everybody in this, uh, in the virtual espressos, I've been so fascinated by the, like the level of creativity and innovation that's happening in the world. All of the manufacturing and, you know, protective gear and working with different ways of um, meeting the moment. And so one of the, um, one of the phrases I also love from the mindfulness tradition is appropriate response. And so if we're not present, we can tend to hop into reactive mode where we're just kind of bouncing against whatever's coming, coming through. We bump up against it and we spring off it and we can go in multiple directions. So that's where taking a moment to really harness and focus our attention can be so powerful. So I'm going to have you do another practice here, just taking a moment 
and notice where your attention is right now. Just notice where your attention is. Maybe there's something going on in your space around you. Maybe there's children around or a dog or just sounds that may be taking your attention away. Maybe you're feeling fully present and here. So just take a moment, notice where your attention is. And then notice how you can pick it up, almost like you're picking up an object. You can pick up your attention and bring it here. And I'm going to have you bring it to your breath and bring it right into the tip of the nostrils. And just take a few breaths, feeling the sensations at the tip of your nostrils. You can close your eyes if you like, or look downward, or keep your eyes open. But just begin to feel the flow of your breath right at the tip of your nostrils. You might notice the coolness or the warmth. Just the felt sense of the breath coming in and out like you're very zooming in, fine point attention right at the tips of your nostrils. Gathering, collecting your attention and just zooming it in, focusing the tips of the nostrils. Noticing if it's warm or cool, you might feel tingly or moist or dry. I'm just feeling the flow of the breath there in the nostrils. A couple more breaths like that, just zooming into the nostrils. You might notice your attention wanders and you can just bring it right back, zoom it back in, placing your attention there. And then if your eyes are closed, you can go ahead and open your eyes. So just notice how that felt. Just notice how it feels and notice if your attention was wandering off, which it will do, of course, what the mind does, the thinking mind, and how you can just pick it up. Again, it's, it's, it, I love that idea of just using that sense of like our attention. We can just pick it up and place it where we want. And I often say it's our most precious human resource because it's really pretty much the only thing we truly have any agency over. And when these crises or events happen where everything kind of, we feel like we have no control, we can remember the one thing we actually have some control over is where we place our attention and then how we relate to the experience, how we relate to what is in front of us. And, and then the next point slash practice I want to share is this idea of opening the view and not landing anywhere. And so often what happens is, um, again, we get this openness. And even when we're working with creative ideas and we want to be able to focus our attention, harness our attention so that we can take action and move these things into the world, um, then something else can occur where we start to get kind of fixated. We can either get fixated on the fear and the anxiety of what's going to happen, which is happening for many people, which is why it helps to mitigate that a little bit with going directly into the nervous system, using those techniques and practices to orient, to land, to arrive, to return back here, and then to be able to harness and focus our attention. So we can either start fixating on fear, anxiety. We can also fixate on our agendas for outcome. We can fixate on an idea of how we want things to be in the future. We can fixate on 
you know, I, one of the things that keeps striking me in this whole situation right now is you hear so often, when is it going to return to normal? When are things going to return to normal? Or what's going to be the new normal? Or this is the new normal. And for some reason that has just been cooking in my mind. And I'm like, no, no normal. How about no normal? And so like that idea of just remaining open so that we can respond appropriately to whatever's needed. And rather than start to get this fixed idea, this fixed view of how things are going to be, which will encourage that kind of defaulting to our deeper habits and patterns. And rather than remaining open so that sense of creativity and innovation can continue to unfold, harnessing our attention can help us focus, implement, and execute. But then we want to let go and open back up to what's needed now. What's needed now? What's needed now? So this idea of opening the view is very rooted in the Buddhist practice, actually. And um, so just take a moment so you can just feel into the space around you. There's uh, practices that we talk about, spacious awareness, and you can actually feel into the space around you. It's very simple, actually. Um, you can just feel, you can even look around your room that you're in, or if you're outside, looking around the space. And just feel the air on your skin. You can feel the space around you, behind you, above you, and that quality of spaciousness. And it can be a little paradoxical, actually, because sometimes when we connect to space, we might feel less in control. We might feel a little unstable. But if you really feel into space, you can even hear my voice moving through the space. Space is actually incredibly stable. Again, paradoxically, if we feel into space, we can notice that everything comes and goes through that space. Sometimes we call it the space of awareness. We're aware of everything that's coming and going. Nowhere to land. Nothing to really hold on to. And the more flexibility we have with our lens of attention, the more agency we have over responding skillfully to whatever's there for us to respond to. So when we zoomed into the nostrils, we did that kind of focusing our attention very narrow. And we can also open that lens of attention like a wide angle, feeling into the space, opening out our view. And the Tibetan Buddhists, they actually use the, they, they describe the true nature of the mind. They use the image of the sky, which is another reason I have this image here the sky-like nature of the mind. And so the last practice, I'll have you do one more thing after this, but the last kind of practice I'm going to have you do is to, it helps if you close your eyes because this is more of an image-based practice, just to get a sense of what that deeper nature, true nature of the mind is. And you can close your eyes or look downward and just take a moment to bring in the image of the sky big, vast, open, spacious, blue sky. Just imagining a big, wide, open, spacious, vast, open, blue sky extending out in all directions. And the way I like to imagine is, you can imagine this from inside your own head, almost like you have a 360 degree view from inside your own head, looking out in all directions vast, open, spacious, blue sky extending out in all directions, wide open space from inside your own head. And like you can see 360 degree view from inside your own head. And any thoughts that come through just through are just like little birds kind of flitting through the space that you can really rest in that vast open space, the sky-like nature of your own mind, and not land anywhere, just remaining open. Notice how that feels.
wide open space, the sky-like nature of your own mind, always there. That spaciousness, that openness is always available. It's only when we either focus our attention voluntarily or more often we get caught. We hitch a ride with something that comes through and we take off in that direction. And then that wide open lens starts to narrow down. And so just take a moment to feel your, your body in the space again and just take a couple nice breaths just to integrate a little back into your breath and body. And just notice how that felt if you were able to follow that, that sense of opening to spaciousness. And then the last thing I wanted to share was this idea of interconnectedness, because I've also been hearing this a lot in this virtual espresso, people talking about um, collaboration, kind of breaking down some of these boundaries around competition, uh, a lot of creativity uh, in that realm. And also, you know, we've been noticing here this sense of um, we are really all in this together. I mean, I've been noticing, I feel like the wings in my psyche have opened up so vast because I'm spending so much time with people all over the globe in Zoom. So there's this openness that's occurring in the interconnection among people. And, um, you know, this is something that the mystics have always talked about the mystics, the, the alchemists, you know, that these experiences we have where there's this rub, that things get difficult, and then they start to transform and open up, and there's a new view, a new reality. And this is a powerful place for us to connect in that openness without our fixed views, without our agendas, without our stances. So I'm going to take my slide off, and I just thought before we shift into discussion, um, Maybe we could go to gallery view and just uh, look at everybody who's here in the Zoom room around the world, just connecting for a moment with the other beings here. Because this is where we're ultimately going to move from old normal or maybe what people might call new normal to being able to respond openly and flexibly to what's actually needed in a collaborative way that has infinite possibilities, just like the sky, that openness. So just take a moment to look around the Zoom, people all over the world, connect for a moment. I know many of you are in Europe and some here in California. Okay, so thank you for inviting me and I'm, I'm open to any questions about any of those practices or the points that I made or anything anybody else wants to share. And Clark, you, of course, if you wanna. What a lovely journey. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Janice. Several things. Thank you really uh, you that you lifted up um, have stayed with me and and one of them that I find so enticing is the the idea that you spoke about of post traumatic growth and I just want to stay with that idea a little bit um, could you yeah. tell us more about that oh yeah yeah I did um I found, I actually learned about this because I found this book. Um, I was doing a different presentation, a talk at a conference, and I was talking about, because I'm, this is like a fascinating topic for me, um, the relationship between suffering and awakening. So it's basically similar to what I was talking about today, it takes it in a slightly different direction, but this relationship between what's difficult and what wakes us up. And I found this fascinating book by this guy named, oh, what was his name? I think it's Stephen Taylor. And um, he talks about awakening experiences and um, how people can, they, they did this study where people would awaken from, they'd have these spontaneous awakenings through music, meditation, art, nature, 
but the biggest on the graph, the biggest impact of awakening, the biggest prompt and instigator of awakening was actually traumatic experiences mm. because they wake us up to impermanence. Like, whoa, things aren't what I thought. I am not in control. Holy cow, I'm wide awake. And so I got interested in that concept and I found another book and I think it's called um, What Doesn't Kill Us. Yeah, What Doesn't Kill Us Makes Us Stronger. And again, I started to read about these studies they did where after these traumatic events, 9-11, you know, cataclysmic ca catastrophes, where, and they found this out in a kind of an interesting way. They would do these surveys afterwards about what happened in people's lives, assuming that there were going to be these difficult situations. People would be addicted to drugs or drinking a lot of alcohol or their relationships would fall apart. Of course, there was a, a large uh, population where that was actually true. But then they added a question to the survey that asked, did anything improve in your life after this huge trauma? And they had a prolific response to that question where people were feeling more connected to the people in their lives, they were feeling much clearer about why they were here on the planet, what their purpose was. They were very much more focused on what was important to them, prioritizing. And they show this, the way they show it in this book, um, and I actually have a slide of it where they show these three trees on a bluff. And, they, and there's this huge storm coming through, windstorm and rain, and there's these three trees on the bluff. And they're the same kind of trees. And after the storm, they show the trees. And the first tree, barely affected, just standing upright. The second tree kind of bowed to the side. And then the third tree, completely kind of mangled, right? But gorgeous, knotted and twisted. And then they show, like, down the road, new sprouts coming out of broken places, right? And... Um, and so they've studied this, that, that this, is a, this is a real thing, that uh, people actually grow stronger. And what supports that, though, you know, because some people grow stronger, some people go down and they can't get up. So what supports the person to have a sort of successful post-traumatic growth and remain open and often more open to life than they've ever been um, is other people support, community, connection. And that's really the key is, is community and connection, interconnectedness, knowing that they're not alone. Yeah, it's powerful. It reminds me of, you probably know this um, Leonard Cohen song, um, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. It's how the light gets in. It's how the light gets in. Thank you for that. I'm sure other people have questions or, or comments, so I'll uh, look forward to those and just leave the mic open for them. Yeah, Janice, when you were speaking, I mean, so much ran through my head, but um, just around this topic, you know, I'm thinking of David Brooks's book, Second Mountain. I don't know if you read that. And he talks about his experience, how, you know, he had this successful career and then his marriage fell apart and all of a sudden he really re-examined uh, his life and he talks about how he was broken open um, as opposed to being broken. And, um, you know, when I heard him say that and hear you speak now, I just think of a seed in its husk. And, you know, that a, a seed husk can be like so strong. Like if you try to open an acorn with your bare hands, you know, that, 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 that seed is not easy to get to. You need some type of tool. But then like what a gift is given when the seed husk is broken and that seed is allowed to grow. And so often we're walking around with these husks, you know, and just kind of in fear of what happens, you know, and we, we have many husks even, I feel like. Um, and so, yes, yeah, such a gift when something externally opens it up. Yeah, and, and my experience is actually, you know, I work with a lot of people who most often they're coming to me because 
the shit hit the fan, the rug got pulled out, the diagnosis came, the divorce papers were served, something like that. And they're just like, ah, I, uh, I'm, wow, you know, just like, Phew. and there's that vulnerability and openness. And um, yeah, it's extremely powerful. And it is interesting that it's often those kinds of situations, like a pandemic, right? Like you're here, I hear so many people, my clients, my friends, my students, the, you know, you hear it on the news, you know, even in small ways, you know, like, wow, I was driving my life away, driving down to work at Google every day, two hours in the car, you know, like, I don't want to do that anymore. How can I change that? You know, or, I mean, just simple things of daily life that people are kind of waking up like a, a little bit of a trance, right? And then how do we stay open? Because <laughs> it's so seductive. I mean, even neuroscience, right? You know, talks about like those deep grooves in our brain that we default to. So it takes a little effort to kind of, once we get a crack in the door is how I think of it. Like we want to like, we got a foot in the door of openness. How can we open that door even wider? You know, so we're working with the nervous system and support with other beings. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, I, I just think keep that that out. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I think the challenge, you know, as a provider, I really struggle with this because on one hand, I feel really kind of empowered and, and um, just privileged to be able to care for people in a time of need and just such, you know, just such a challenge that I feel like I can be a part of. But on the other hand, I feel incredibly let down by the healthcare system, the government, my hospital who just gave us all pay cuts, <laughs> not enough, you know, protective gear. And so it's very hard to stay focused and open to the positive of kind of post-traumatic or intra-traumatic growth and harness those other reactions in a, in a positive and, and a, you know, helpful way. It's hard for me. I, I just, to be honest, I, I really struggle with that. Yeah, I totally get that. And, um, you know, I think everybody's in a different um, sort of scale in terms of how they're feeling in relation to that. And no matter, you know, like part of what these teachings offer us is to recognize the reality, right? We are not in control, right? You can't control that situation. It's super frustrating and really not easy to be with. What you can have some agency over is your own being right? right and so that's what this is really it's the inner job and you know the reality is and this is again scientifically proven there is a field of resonance right so even if we don't do take action how we're being in our nervous system in our own presence is what can impact the whole because we are interconnected biologically, physiologically, neurobiologically. We are completely interconnected. And so, you know, I think about this often when I'm with some of my clients, who some of them are going through really difficult things. And I could easily get, you know, very caught in some things that they're suffering with because it's, you know, empathy and compassion and just heartbreaking. And I can also get incredibly furious just watching the news briefings. Like I want to like bang my head against the wall, right? But what I know is that if I go down that road, if I get hooked, if I get caught, if I start galloping off on my high horse about how things should be and what should be done, or if I merge with that suffering of somebody else, then I'm not going to be able to help people. I'm not going to be able to serve. I'm not going to be able to respond appropriately to the moment. So what I find is if I can really starting with the nervous system, like, oh, I'm here, you know, I'm in the hospital right now. This is where I am, right? And this is what is occurring. Taking a few deep breaths, finding that way to both resource myself so that I can remain and then open from there. So that's where it can get a little confusing. I think sometimes like it's not just like wide open, it's all good. That's kind of like overriding our biology mm -hmm. and the truth of the human experience, which is very mixed. It's always very mixed, but we tend to default to 
you know, get that guy out of office, what the hell, or, oh my God, you know, catastrophic thinking, and we get hooked everywhere. And so the more we can find the balance, in a sense, find the middle, mm -hmm. and the first step is like, oh, I'm here. I'm here, I'm here, and now I have some choice over how to respond. It's just coming back right here and then seeing what's happening, what's really happening in this relative re space of reality, what's the most appropriate response. And it might be, I need to go for a walk because I am not regulated. I cannot self-regulate in this environment. I need to go to the bathroom and take some breaths and feel my feet on the tile floor. You know, it might be something very simple. I need to bring some kindness towards myself so that I can hold this human suffering. Yeah, so it's a lot to, to be with. Yeah. Janice, earlier you spoke about uh, the, the new normal uh, movement. It feels like people are moving toward wanting to uh, either rubber band back to the way it used to be or uh, renorming in, in some way. And it really struck me that, I mean, to your point of the big open sky, that uh, the, the drive for, quote, normal is in itself a, a little weird. And, and I, I was just thinking about the John Cage statement, the composer who said, um, I don't know why people are so afraid of new ideas the old ideas are the ones that frighten me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Could you talk a little bit about this drive to normal? Yeah. Well, it's seeking the, you know, it's like clinging to the shore, right? It's like we don't like being out to sea for long periods of time without seeing the other side. It's super uncomfortable. And so, you know, part of that kind of resourcing resilience is building the capacity to tolerate the discomfort, to be with what is super uncomfortable because it's the unknown, it's the unfamiliar. And yet the physicists, the mystics, the alchemists, they all knew this and philosophers and the Buddhists, uh, the Buddha, they knew, you know, and all you, you creative thinkers, right? That n the new comes out of the space, the new idea, something new will occur if we don't put something in there or, or fix, get fixated. But the challenge, the difficulty as human beings is to remain open, to be in that space because it's so uncomfortable. So the practices are so helpful first to mitigate that nervous system, fight or flight, not getting hijacked, or if we do, how to begin to come back to being present, to being here, oh, I'm here. And then to familiarize ourselves with that openness. We're most, because the more familiar we become with openness, then we don't feel like we need to cling to shore. Because honestly, you know, if you think about it, like, it's so interesting to me. It's again, a little paradoxical, right? So we, people are, we're afraid of the unknown, but this concept of the unknown is like, a, a, is like an idea. It's like we're, put, we're actually putting the known, the fear of the unknown is because we're putting the known into the emptiness of, of, the, uh, of the mystery, basically. What we're perceiving, what we're projecting into the unknown that makes us afraid is the known. Because what comes out of the openness is, is not known yet. So it's this interesting paradox where what we're actually afraid of is what we already know. And so again, it's sort of that defaulting to the familiar, even in our fear. We fear what we, we know, we're projecting into the future. So the idea of like we feel, and sometimes I'll talk about it like even just in the midst of the day, hitting the pause button and just familiarizing yourself like the most foundational thing, simple, simple, not easy. It's a language you often use, simple, but not easy. It's so simple, but just pausing and coming back. Oh, I'm here. Familiarizing yourself with just feeling 
your feet on the floor, noticing, and again, the sense doors are very powerful because they, they're, they kind of speak more to that primal brain, that fight or flight, it sort of quells that hypervigilance. You look around the colors, the textures, the smells, the sounds, and then it's like, oh, I'm here, and get familiar with that. Oh, I'm here. This is what here, this is what actually being here feels like. Not in fear, not lost in thought, not thinking about the new normal, but just here, right? And then we see somebody we're working with, and we can actually hear them. Oh, I'm present. And then our nervous system is regulated, and suddenly they're in training a little with that. They're feeling the resonance of that. So it has this kind of ripple effect. But so much of it is just getting familiar, and that's why these practices can be so helpful, because they give us space to begin to gradually slowly, you know, gradually over time, we build the capacity to tolerate the discomfort of the unknown. And over time, what we start to discover, it's like that sense of emptiness or groundlessness or, you know, that we're afraid of that tends to make us cling to the shore or the familiar actually is incredibly alive. And people are also feeling that now. So again, it's very mixed right? It's like tragedy and suffering. And then there's like this incredible openness and possibility and it's filled with energy. So openness and space, people often are afraid, like I'm going to just be nothing. It's going to be empty. I'm going to be nobody. Identity, ego starts to go, ah, I got to hold on to something. I got to be somebody. I got to do something. And yet when we let go of that, all this energy and aliveness starts to come into the foreground and the possibilities open up and new things come. We talk often in our <clears throat> design thinking discipline of the idea of the traveler's mind, which is one that is ne by necessity a discovery mindset because we are unfamiliar with the world around us. And uh, Eli, uh, uh, Ellie put a comment in, in the chat uh, that I'd like you to think with us on. I think the ideas we're intending to convey are stability and predictability. And I think, if, you know, there's that, there's that uh, uh, constructed world version of that, and then maybe there's an internal awareness of that. Uh, maybe you could share some wisdom about that. Yeah, I've thought about that a lot too, right? You know, all this whole, the situation of the pandemic is, I mean, from my work, it's, it's just shining a light on so many things about the truth of the way things are. And um, so this idea, right, so we, we think, you know, this is all just perception. It's perception. It's, you know, often called an illusion, sometimes delusion that things are ever predictable, that we can ever uh, plan, you know, there's that saying, you know, like any, I can't remember what the saying is, but just, you know, we make our plans and then we have to let them go because nothing goes the way we think. And, you know, it's so fascinating how our minds work to construct a reality and then inevitably that constructed reality, because it's a construction generated from our own thinking mind, ultimately that is going to fall apart because nothing is actually fixed. And again, the physicists, the mystics, they all understood this. It's scientific now, um, but it's it, it, that sense that things are fixed in any way or actually stable is just not true. Mm. So that is very difficult to be with. But the paradox again is that once we can let go of that perception or that concept of things being a certain way forever um, or staying a certain way, because they do, they, they land for a while and then they come undone. They land, they come together, they come apart. But within that, within which all of that is occurring is this incredible open space, <laughs> this vast open space of awareness. That's why I brought in the sky because the sky like nature of our mind or even feeling into the space around you. And this is like, again, like a mini practice you can do throughout the day. If you start to feel like, 
I am so caught. I am so tangled. I am so anxious. We can open to space. We can look around the room. And if we're in a small, quiet, closed space, we can close our eyes and imagine the sky. We can open our view because every, it, that view, that openness can include everything. It can include all, all of our difficulties, all of our sufferings, because we're not fixating on them. We're not going down the rabbit hole. We're not getting tangled and caught and wrestling and fighting with it the way it should be. Why is it this way? I want it to be that way. It should be that way. We open the view. And it's like, oh yeah, this is just part of human life. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's so much more that's occurring in that field if I really open my view. It's not just that one little narrow thing that I keep defaulting to, defaulting to my fear, my anxiety, the unknown. Oh, no, no, no. Got to get a grip. Got to put my stake in the ground. Got to create my thing. Got to put a mark on my place on the internet and start my whole new brand because now we're all online, right? It's like, wow, what if we just pause and just go, wow, so much happening in this huge open space. And if I can just open up, and allow that all to occur. I'm going to remain open and things will just unfold. And then I'll know, oh, this is mine to do, right? That's mine to do. Nope, that's not mine to do. That's mine to do. We start mm -hmm. to get some clarity around what is actually ours to do in that openness and space. Thank you. You know, we're um, soon to conclude our hour with you, Janice, uh, may I ask you if you would uh, lead us in a short closing ritual, and then Jeff, if you could um, come back in and, and uh, close out our session. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Janice, so much for uh, being with us and sharing with us and leading us this morning. You know, maybe I'll close. I was going to read a poem, but I can't find it. So so just take a moment and um, just notice maybe for yourself anything that was touched for you in that uh, session today. Anything that you feel might be helpful for you as you re-enter into your day today, into your daily life. And just notice what that might be. It might be simply taking a breath, focusing on the nostrils, locating yourself in place, in space and time. Might be looking at the sky or imagining the sky. Just if there's anything that felt like it might be beneficial for you, just make a little note for yourself to remember that. And then just remembering that we are all in this together, in our humanness, in our difficulties, in our openness as well. And that it's ultimately that human connection and our interconnectedness that will support us to be with no normal. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>